So structures of ionic solids. I'm gonna finish chapter, this is actually chapter, I know this is 13 here. I forgot to change these, this is 12. B12 in your book. So many ionic compounds are crystalline structures that are closely related to the unit cells that we looked at. They'll have to accommodate two different types of ions. So sometimes, depending on different charges and the sizes of those ions, they form these different structures. And the coordination number represents the number of close cation interactions. So higher coordination number means more of these interactions, and that in turn causes lower potential energy. So more interaction between positive charges and negative charges. So more similar the size of the cation and anion, the higher the coordination number. So the crystal structure is a balance of all of these things, coordination number, charge neutrality, so being able to neutralize charges, and then the sizes of the ions. So if you've got an ionic solid with ions of similar size, this is the body-centered cubic cell. What, chloride ions? Yeah, of a simple cubic cell. All right, coordination number eight, yeah, because it's six, yeah, it was six and then eight. So like your simple cubic cell would be if we just had these ions that are on the outside here, the chlorides. And then there would be like another cesium up here, there'd be another cesium down here, all, the, all these sides, but this is the simplest unit cell. And we can put that cesium in the middle, which makes this the body-centered cubic. So calcium sulfide, we replaced cesium with calcium and this was sulfide. Again, we've got ions that are of similar size, sorry, calcium. Calcium, which is gonna be a two plus, and sulfur, which is gonna be a two minus, so these are also gonna be existing in a one-to-one -one ratio throughout the whole structure. So we get ionic solids with different sized ions. If ion size were the only consideration, then we could just take sodium ions and completely pack them around each of these massive chloride ions. But you can't do that because we need to balance the charges because each of those massive chloride ion only has a one minus charge. So we can only have a one to one ratio of the chloride ions. Because if we packed all of those sodiums in, it would have way more sodiums than chlorides and our charges wouldn't be balanced. So because of that, that means that each of these chloride ions needs to be next to at least one sodium ion and that limits our coordination number to six. So then the chloride ions occupy a face-centered cubic structure, which is hard to see. And then the sodium ions are between them. So also a rock salt structure. So each unit cell is gonna contain four of each ion. And then they're trying to show this here that this is, so this is the whole unit cell. See, this feels like more than face-centered. So we got the one in the middle and then there's one that's halfway in each face. Then there's also these sodium ions that fit in between on the edges. It's saying the chloride ions occupied what would be a face-centered cubic. But this isn't face-centered cubic because we need to fit more sodium, we can fit more sodium ions in here. So our simplest cube, our simplest unit cell is just a cube where we've got a chloride, Try and draw this, sodium, chloride, sodium, and then this is a chloride, this is a sodium. And then there would be another sodium on the backside there. So like this section, that's the unit cell. So each corner of that cube has one atom. When it says the face centered, so the chlorides occupy faces if it was a face center cubic. But we can simplify this down into just one of these little blocks. Yeah. It's the simple, simple cubic unit cell. So the coordination number is six. 
Yeah. Like if I zoom in here, the thing that I drew up here, so like this chloride would be this chloride. This one would be this one. Yeah, sodium, sodium, and then the same thing mirrored underneath it. These are also more ionic solids with large size differences. But if we make that larger even, then the coordination number drops to four. So we didn't look at unit cells that had coordination numbers of four, but this is called a zinc blend structure. I mean, I guess it's because it's zinc and then there's sulfur in there, so it's a blend of zinc and sulfur. But the sulfur ions make this tetrahedral and then within each tetrahedral of sulfur ions, there's a zinc that fits into the hole in the middle. So just like a methyl group or methane, we have a, so if this was a methane, there would be a carbon in the middle and then each of the four corners would be a hydrogen. And so we're getting that same shape, but now with zinc and sulfur in a crystal lattice. So each of those that we looked at had equal ion charges. And so we have equal numbers of each type of ion. This is a structure with unequal numbers of ions because we have calcium, which is a two plus, and fluoride, which is a one minus. So we get a completely different structure. This is a fluorite structure. So calcium ions are in a face-centered cubic structure. So calcium, calcium, meaning if we drew a cube around this, the calciums are in faces of that cube. But this is, yeah, and then we get still tetrahedral shapes. Right, so if we look at these four calciums as the corners of that tetrahedral, there's a fluoride stuck in the middle of those. So we got a whole series of tetrahedrals. So four cations and then eight anions for this whole unit cell. So this is one to two cation to anion. This is two to one. So if there are two cations, I guess I would say one X anion. So antifluoride. So the same structure, but the charges are flipped. All right, those are the ionic structures. Network covalent atomic solids. The first one we're gonna talk about is carbon. So I told you about like at the beginning of this lecture, there was the, I talked about graphene. And uh, so carbon can have a lot of different forms. Allotropes is what they're called. Graphite, which is lead, pencil lead. We've got carbon atoms, which are covalently bonded into flat sheets of interconnected hexagonal rings. And that's why if you put a piece of tape on a block of graphite and pull up that piece of tape, it will remove a single layer of graphene or these hexagonal rings. And then those, all of those individual layers are held together by dispersion forces, so they're not super well held together, which is why if you try to write with it, if you're writing with a pencil, you can rub those layers off, smear those onto the paper. And it's just dispersion forces holding those together. You can also get graphite and use it as a lubricant, but it's just powdered graphite. So you could do that with pencil lead too. I actually use that on my guitar to like at the top bridge where the tuning pegs are. Sometimes if you're trying to tune and the strings will stick in that bridge, you can take, when you change your strings, you can take a regular pencil and just scribble into those grooves a little bit. And then when you tune, the tuning pegs or the strings don't stick into that bridge. So you use graphite just from a pencil to do that. And then these graphene, it's not, shown here, but these are a series of really benzene rings. And so we've got systems like this with lots of pi bonds. And then this would extend out and there'd be another one over here. Yeah. And then there's another one. And it's a whole series of all of these hexagons, each held together by a whole bunch of pi bonds. I don't know exactly where those would go. But because we've got this extended series of pi bonds, there's all of these electrons that are able to move around a little bit because these bonds can actually move around. And that makes the graphite a really good conductor of electricity. If you can connect electrodes to single sheets. Graphite has a density of 2.2. 
And if you take it and you put it under really high pressure, the graphite will reconfigure into diamond. There's actually a method I've seen on YouTube. This end of the chapter, by the way, is going to be full of a ton of asides. <laughs> There's a method I've seen on YouTube where you take graphite and you take two coffee cups in a microwave and you stick the coffee cups on top of each other. I think you might have to put something else in between aside from the graphite. And then you microwave it for an hour or something and you can make diamond in your microwave. Not a lot <laughs> and not pretty diamonds that you'd want to put on a ring, but you can make diamond in a microwave. And now there are actually a lot of methods where you don't necessarily need really high pressure. They can like vapor deposit graphene onto surfaces to make diamonds. And like synthetic diamonds, synthetic diamonds are absolutely a thing. And there's also no reason that like diamonds from the earth should be expensive. There's liter literally a diamond, was it a cartel or a cabal? No, that doesn't sound right. Basically, all the people who have all the places where diamonds are mined, they just hold on to almost all of them. And they've all had an agreement that we're just going to sell them real slow so that there's, they're scarce, so that they're expensive. Yeah. And they spent millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars, trying to prove that synthetic diamonds, well, that they could tell the difference between synthetic diamonds and diamonds that come out of the earth, and they can't. <laughs> they're no different. No reason to buy anything. Also, there's other things that are better than diamonds. I'm a little biased because I got my wife a moissanite ring when we got engaged. Anyways, so if you take graphene, though, or graphite, put it under super high temperature and pressure, or use otherwise sophisticated methods, you can compress it so much that the covalent bonds rearrange and become the structure that is diamond. And that's a network covalent atomic solid. So it's this whole network. So any diamond that you have is a single molecule, in a sense. All of those carbon atoms are covalently bonded to each other throughout a whole network. So that's why it's a network covalent. The structure of the diamond is similar to a zinc blend, where we've got these tetrahedrals. So we've got this whole series of tetrahedrals. You can see the, let's see if I can try and trace some of this. There's a hexagon there, and there's a, this is like one of those optical illusions. There's a hexagon there, right? So it's, you can think of it as a whole bunch of tetrahedrals connected together or a whole bunch of hexagons connected together. So really high melting point because what determines the melting point of something? Intermolecular forces. But what if our intermolecular forces were all molecular forces, right? If they were all covalent bonds, it would take a lot of energy to break those bonds and melt it. So that's why diamond melts at 3,800 degrees C. And it's an excellent conductor. So high pressure for, favors the formation of diamond to graphite. What can you conclude about the relative densities of the two substances? So it takes high pressure to form diamond. Yeah, we literally saw two slides ago that is like goes from 2.2 to 3.5. So it gets more dense. So it actually rearranges to be more compact. So diamond is denser than graphite. Yep. Carbon does a lot of cool stuff. These are fun. Uh, in the 1980s, some dude was shooting lasers at carbon, and he made this, Buckminster Fullerene which is a soccer ball shaped cluster of 60 carbon atoms. So it's a soccer ball made of carbon atoms and you can make these in different sizes. So from 30, as low as 36 or up to 100, they're also called buckyballs. So those are fun. I mentioned these earlier too, carbon nanotubes. So if we take that sheet of carbon and then we roll them up into little tubes, those do fun stuff also. <laughs> so it's sheets of interconnected C6 rings. So taking these sheets, rolling them up into rings. They're 100 times stronger than steel, only 1 16th as dense. So it's stronger and lighter than steel. So useful for lightweight applications. And then you can do bundles of nanotubes to form tiny wires because they're conductive. 
So if somebody could figure out how to make these efficiently, I would change so much stuff, right? Like airplanes could be lighter, cars could be lighter. What, do you know anything about like this ridiculous tensile strength of like spider silk? Mm. And would that, yeah. would that give this like run for money? Or do you think carbon nanotubes are like just... Yeah, I don't know how carbon nanotubes compare to spider silk. I know it's a lot easier to make carbon, I think it's easier to make carbon nanotubes. Yeah, I think it's like, they still haven't found a way to replicate Yeah, like how do you, maybe we need to use carbon nanotubes to make spider silk. Done dusted, that's it. <laughs> no, I don't, yeah, I don't know how the strength compares. But both of them, if we could figure out how to make them, would be fantastic. So we move on to silicates. Silicates are, right, make up glass. It's also sand. 90% of the Earth's crust are silicates. So if you look at a rock and you're like, hey, I wonder what that rock's made of, silicates. Different kinds of silicates. Quartz, silicate. And so this is, they're common in ceramic, cement, glass, mostly silicon and oxygen. And it just happens to be that most of the Earth is made of this. Quartz is a particular form of silica. There's actually a global shortage of sand. Because do you know what computer chips are made out of? Silicon. And specifically, it's river sand. So there's a bunch of YouTube videos out there about this. But they go through and they'll dredge up sand from the riverbeds. And then they take that and they turn it into computer chips. Specifically, that sand, because it's been rounded by the river rounded by all the flowing water over, who knows, thousands of years. And so it makes it a lot easier to work with. Desert sand, on the other hand, hasn't been rounded out. And it either doesn't work or destroys the equipment that you try to make computer chips out of with it. So river sand. Unfortunately, again, there's another one of these things that if we can figure out how to use desert sand to make computer chips, that'd be great. There's a lot of desert sand. Yeah, so then the question would be, how long do I need to leave my sand at the river before it's good for making computer chips? Probably a really long time. But yeah, I had that thought too. Why can't we just put the sand, take the desert from here, take the desert sand, push it into the river? <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a time factor. And then you have to move all the sand. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that, at least until we run out of river sand then somebody will do that. Yeah. Anyway, so silicates, also used in ceramics. So ceramics are traditionally defined as inorganic, non-metallic solids that are prepared from powders, usually mixed with water and then heated. Dictionary definition there. So take the inorganic, non-metallic solids, so silicates, and then mix them with water and then heat them up. And then depending on the combination of the silicates and other things that are part of that, you can get, if you've ever done ceramics, I've actually never done ceramics, would be fun, but you can do different things to get different glazes, also different types of ceramics come from different types of materials. Right. So sil silicate ceramics are composed of aluminosilicates, so aluminum and silicon, and you're replacing some of the silicon atoms with aluminum or aluminum if you're from across the pond. So weathering of naturally occurring aluminosilicates produces clays and then you have to heat them up causes reactions that actually form that ceramic. So the clay kaolinite is Al2Si2O5OH4 undergoes that irreversible chemical change so this would be an aluminum silicate above 1500 degrees C. And then you end up with a white ceramic solid with an extended network of silicon oxide and aluminum oxide tetrahedra. So multiple tetrahedrons. So one of the most important things in porcelain, so if you have fine china, it's probably porcelain originated in China. What about a toilet? Huh, toilet? <laughs> Probably didn't originate in China, but it probably it's still porcelain. So it's still maybe made from kaolinite, probably made from kaolinite. I want to call it a kaolinite throne. The kaolinite throne, yeah. That's good. I like the porcelain throne, yeah. 
So oxide ceramics, so slightly different from the aluminosilicates, include aluminum oxide, magnesium oxide. So take those and same process. You can use those in industrial furnaces, high-speed cutting tools, crucibles, heating elements, and fireproofing. There's probably nothing that's... It's so like a lot of these things are stable at like really high temperatures. This is an aside, but like fusion reactors, the problem with the fusion reactor is that it's like thousands of times hotter than the surface of the sun. We say that it's the surface of the sun. That's because the inside of the sun is as hot as we need to get, and that's the hottest part of the sun. Uh, it would melt all of these. So instead they use magnets, or they try to use magnets. Haven't done it yet. Non-oxide ceramics include stuff like silicon nitride, boron nitride, silicon carbide, so all stuff that's really pretty close together on the periodic table. Again, we don't have a whole bunch of different non-metals to choose from, but silicon nitride is used or is a network covalent solid similar to silica, used in engine parts, non-metallic bearings. Boron nitride is isoelectric with C2. If you take boron and nitrogen, it's gonna have the same number of electrons as two carbon atoms because two carbon atoms would have six ele 12 electrons between them, but five plus seven is also 12, so that's, that's what it means by isoelectric. Probably heard of silicon carbide, usually used in place of diamonds, so if you're not using a diamond studded cutting wheel or something, it'll be silicon carbide, which is cheaper, although again, diamonds shouldn't be expensive. So used as an abrasive and a high temperature material can also be an additive to steel, so you can give silicon carbide steel. Make the steel stronger. Cements are interesting, and then you probably, I don't know how much you are on Nerd Talk, but on TikTok there's always videos about how Roman cement was so much better than modern cement, and how did they do it, and we recently figured it out. It actually turns out, so cement, first invented by the Romans, they used lime, volcanic ash, and clay, they made this pourable slurry, and you could pour it into things, and then it solidifies, and you can make structures out of it. Most cement is Portland cement, which is just a specific mixture of limestone, silica, smaller amounts of aluminum, iron oxide, and gypsum, so calcium sulfate. And it reacts with water in a number of complex reactions that produce rock-like substances. So the cement actually needs to be wet to activate the reactions that make it harden. The trick, to, the trick to Roman cement, actually, because they eventually figured out what the recipe should be. They tried mixing all those things together, and their problem was they mixed it too well. So they mixed it too well, and what makes Roman cement so good is that it's got chunks of calcium carbonate inside of it still that haven't been dissolved into the rest of the mixture. So if cracks form and water gets in there, it dissolves some of that calcium carbonate and reactivates the cement to essentially self-heal cracks that form, which is crazy. So when they were making their own, when they were trying to reinvent this, they were like, oh, mix it super well. It must need to be mixed super well. Of course, mixing it must be better. It turns out it wasn't. It needed to not be mixed as well. So concrete, as opposed to cement, Concrete is the combination of cement and then small rocks or sand or other things. And the addition of those other materials inside increases the strength, makes up about half of all man-made structures, and it produces like 40% of all, man, or all arthropogenic sources of CO2. Because the process of the cement hardening, or the concrete hardening, produces CO2. And there's also just the production of the cement makes CO2. So huge amount of CO2 produced from just this. Glass, probably all familiar with glass. It's silicon and oxygen atoms, but the strongest form of, and actually it's not a crystal, it's an amorphous structure. So it's a randomly ordered assortment of silicon and oxygen atoms. The strongest glass is not pure silicon and oxygen. The strongest glass has other stuff in it. And we get to that in the next slide. So it's great, right? Because we can see through it. It's transparent, great for windows. Doesn't let the water in. Yeah, outstanding for making windows and drinking glasses. And also, actually not super great for glasses to see with. 
It's too heavy. So use plastics for that, but all kinds of things. The Romans were the first ones to extensively develop glass making. So added sodium carbonate, which reduced the melting point of the silica so you can melt it at lower temperatures, also known as soft glass. And then they also developed glass blowing, which is melted glass is blown into spherical shapes using a tube. If you ever get a chance to go to Seattle, they have the Chihuly Museum. And I don't remember the guy's first name. Chihuly was his last name. But he did like this insane glass blowing stuff. He's got these massive glass chandeliers. All of it's hand blown. And it's, I should put a picture in here. I'll look up a picture later. So more glass, vitreous silica or fused silica glass. That's silicon oxide, which is very hard, resists high temperatures, and has a low thermal expansion. And it's transparent to both visible and ultraviolet light. So those UV vises that we had out, wait. Oh no, this was at the beginning of the semester. I pulled out that UV vis because I wanted to quantify who had the lightest pink from that first titration. <laughs> Those can produce UV light, and sometimes you need UV light to pass through your sample to quantify something, right? If you don't use the fused silica glass, regular glass, like these are made out of, is not transparent to UV light. So use those special glass, they're called cuvettes for that. Soda lime glass, that's what these are probably made out of, or window glass is the most common type of modern glass. So it's softer, and we've replaced 70% of the silicon, or it's about 70% silicon oxide, and the rest of it being sodium oxide or calcium oxide tend to crack under thermal shock. I actually had a car window one time break because of thermal shock. Exploded in a just, well, very startling fashion. The strongest, or one of the strongest types of glass is borosilicate glass. Now it says here, or Pyrex. Pyrex is a brand name. Used to be great stuff, and then they sold out. So the name Pyrex got sold to another company, and they make, they do still make some of the good Pyrex glass that doesn't break, but if you went to Walmart right now and you bought something and it said Pyrex on it, I would doubt whether it's the really good Pyrex glass. So one time, a stupid thing that I did at home in high school, never do this, I took, it was actually dangerous for more reasons that I learned recently, but I took a, a measuring cup, glass measuring cup, may or may not have been Pyrex, don't remember, filled it up with a little bit of water, then I poured some isopropyl alcohol in that, and then I set that on fire, because I was like, had recently learned that alcohol will float on water and be on fire. Terrible idea. So I did that, again, high school, it's very stupid. And I was like, ah, oh, that's cool. And then five seconds later, how do I put this fire out? <laughs> so what would you do? First impulse, pour water in it. So I got some water from the sink, nice and cold, <laughs> and I dumped that into the hot water, and the measuring cup exploded. And fortunately, that explosion or the dispersal of the alcohol was enough that it put it out. But here's the thing with alcohol fires. You can't use water to put them out <laughs> because the water goes under the alcohol <laughs> and it continues to burn on the surface. So I didn't burn my parents' house down. But don't do that. If you do end up in a situation like that, not because you're doing this on purpose, but because of a horrible accident, smother it. So get a dish towel, get it wet, and then throw it over the top, and it'll smother it. Again, if you have something like a grease fire, cover it with the pot lid. <laughs> Don't pour water in it. Also very bad. Anyways, if that measuring cup, this is how this ties back in, if that measuring cup had been made out of real Pyrex, it wouldn't have broken. <laughs> because it would have been temperature resistant or resisted temperature changes. It was probably the soda lime glass, which is much cheaper to make. There's also leaded glass, which has lead oxide alongside silicon oxide. It has a higher index of refraction, so it looks brighter. I think actually this is what, uh, oh, what's that special, there's special glass that they make like cups and stuff out of. Temp really fancy. No, not tempered glass. Dang it. I think if you get anything that's real, that's like crystal, like it's a, a cup and it's, oh, this is crystal and not glass, it's leaded glass. It's more brilliant, it sparkles nicer. Uh, there are some concerns though because there's lead in it, lead toxicity. 
So that's why we needed lead-free crystal. There's a particular brand name that I'm thinking of. OK, I probably have a lot fewer things to say about semiconductors and band theory, so hopefully we can get through this. We're doing OK on time. So band theory and semiconductors go hand in hand because it's band theory that makes semiconductors semiconductant. So band theory is a more comprehensive model for metallic and covalent solids. Comes out of molecular orbital theory. Sorry, we talked about metallic solids as just being metal nuclei in a sea of electrons. So it's a little bit more nuanced than that. The atomic orbitals of atoms within a crystal combined and then are delocalized over the whole crystal. So we looked at molecular orbital theory as like just two atoms. Now if you take that and then you expand that over the whole thing, you've got all of these overlapping orbitals. Like I said, with the network covalent solids, the crystal is like a very large molecule. And then when these atoms combine, they form these molecular orbitals. The lower the energy, the bonding orbitals, or sorry, the lower energy orbitals or bonding orbitals are occupied, and that leaves the antibonding orbitals empty. So if you increase the number of atoms, the energy difference between the bonding and non-bonding gets smaller and smaller. And it'll change more for other things, or depending on what it is. So like for lithium atoms, if we just have a single lithium atom, then we've got this one electron in the one orbital. We get two lithium atoms, and we've got two electrons in there, and we would, I guess, have two bonding orbitals technically, but one's not filled, so we got the antibonding, and so on and so forth. And you end up with a band of occupied orbitals that form the bonds, and then a band of empty orbitals which can conduct electrons. So we can pass electrons through that conductance band. So half the orbitals are bonding orbitals, contain valence electrons, the other half are antibonding, and they're empty. And so then it's the gap between these bands that makes them either conductive or non-conductive. So our electrons will become mobile when they move from the highest occupied molecular orbitals in the valence band to the higher energy molecular orbitals, the conduction band. So for metals, there's no gap between these two, which is why electrons will just pass freely through the whole thing. If they can move freely from, those, from the valence band to the conduction band and back again, it's completely free. Oh, so then thermal conductivity, so like the amount of heat that is transferred through something, you probably experienced this. Did you guys ever have or ever go to a park where they have those metal slides? Yes. And if it's sunny, and you touch that metal slide, it will burn you. But if you went to, if the, in the same park, if they had a plastic slide, you can go on the plastic slide just fine. They can be the same temperature. The, that extra heat that you feel from the metal is thermal conductance. So it feels hotter because it's very rapidly transferring the heat to you. And the plastic doesn't do that. So thermal conductance, thermal conductivity, occurs because those mobile electrons in the conduction band can quickly transport that heat energy throughout the lattice. So for our conductors, no energy gap. For semiconductors, there will be a small gap. For insulators, there's a large gap between these. So the easier it is for the valence bond electrons to get into the conductance band, the easier it is for it to conduct electricity. So if we take our semiconductors too and we heat them up, they'll actually become more conductive lowering this gap between the two. All right, and this is called band gap theory. So the band gap decreases as you move down a column of elements, atomic periodic table trend. So carbon is about 5.5 electron volts, whereas lead is none, no difference. And we picked this one because it goes from being a non-metal, which is by itself non-conductive, an insulator, we've got semi-metals or metalloids, which are semiconductors. Tin is a metal, lead is a metal, and those are both conductive. Right, so moving down. Now doping, you may have heard of as, this is not related to sports. <laughs> this is not blood doping, yeah. This is doping semiconductors. So you're taking the semiconductors, and in a sense, no, it's not the same. We're taking other things that aren't the semiconductor and putting them in there to make them either more or less conductive and usually more conductive and in different ways. 
So we have n-type semiconductors where we put something into or we incorporate something else into the crystal lattice that has more electrons and that adds those electrons into the conduction band. So it makes the whole thing more conductive. So taking silicon, silicon on the periodic table, doping it with phosphorus, adds additional electrons. They go into the conduction band. And then these are negatively charged electrons, so it's n-type. So since we're putting more electrons into the conductance band, it's negatively charged and gives us the n-type. So the n stands for negative type. The other way we can do this, though, is to take a p-type semiconductor, which has electron holes in the valence band. So if we take silicon again, but this time dope it with gallium, it ends up with empty molecular orbitals, which allows for conductant conduction because electrons in the valence band can move between the holes of the valence band. So different type of conductance. So one of these is happening in the conducting band. The other one you can get to happen in the valence band. And then like negative charge, like the negative charge for n-type is a positive charge for p-type. And these p-n junctions are at the heart of most electronic devices. So this is how we make different gates. This is the physical representation of ones and zeros in a computer. Something being on or off in one of these p-n junctions. <clears throat> yeah, so there are tiny spots. There will be tiny spots that are p-type on one side and n-type on the other. And they can act as diodes, meaning that the electrons can only flow in one direction. So what would you dope germanium with to make a p-type semiconductor? So for silicon, if we want an n-type, we dope it with phosphorus. If we want a p-type, we dope it with gallium. So for germanium, want a, was it p-type? P-type. So if we dope it with arsenic, that would be an n-type. Dope it with indium, it would be a p-type. All right, last thing then. Polymers and plastics, I don't know about the mi microplastic problem. Polymers are what make up all of those plastics. They're not just in synthetic plastics, but they're natural polymers, starches, proteins, DNA, your hair is a natural polymer. Then there's synthetic polymers like PVC, right? PVC pipes, it's polyvinyl chloride, styrofoam, nylon, plexiglass. What is the one that clothes are made out of? Polyester, it's another synthetic fiber or another synthetic polymer. The polymers are durable because longer molecules have greater intermolecular forces, which we talked about with the carbon, right? All of those covalent bonds make it really strong. And so they have higher melting points and boiling points. And then breaking or tearing a polymer either involves overcoming the intermolecular forces between those long polymer chains or breaking covalent bonds and actually just breaking those chains. Gosh, this is a really cool talk. What was that on? Yeah, it's a really cool talk at ACS actually, where they were talking about using using polymers that were intended to break at a certain point on those polymer chains, based on and then based on the way that you create the polymers, you put a weak spot in those polymer chains. So you could get something like if you've ever gotten I don't know, what's a good example of this? There's stuff where it's got like the plastic on the top and then it's like perforated, but imagine now if it was just the plastic because those have been like had holes poked in it. Now it's just designed so that part of that plastic is just naturally weaker than the rest. And so you can pull on it and it rips without having to be perforated. So you can almost like program or preset where those breakpoints are gonna be and set up weaker covalent bonds intentionally. So polyethylene, this is ethylene, H2, CH2, with a double bond between those carbons. And so polyethylene is where we've taken a lot of the poly this is probably the polymers. So a mer would be a single unit. So it's lots of units that come together to make long chains. So in polyethylene, it's not a chain of this, but it's a, just a chain of carbons attached to carbons with single bonds. These are usually initiated with radical reactions. So you take some species, I don't know, I'm just gonna make it B, with a single electron on it, and it comes over here and it reacts with one of these carbons and it breaks this bond, 
And that comes over here, so this carbon would get like a lone pair. We actually use half arrows for these. And then this half arrow goes over here, and now that carbon doesn't have a lone pair, but it's got a radical. And that radical is highly reactive, and it can run into another ethylene, and the radical can react, and it will form a bond with another ethylene. So we got our ethylene. So this radical can react with one electron from here, and it'll break that bond, and then they'll form a bond. And now this has a radical. And that radical can go and run into another ethylene and form another bond, and it's just, it's a self-propagating reaction. And then if you want to end the reaction, you would throw in something that would react with the radicals and stop the radical reaction. Right? That would use those radicals up to stop it. And then depending on when you terminate it, you can change the length of the polymers and different, get different qualities out of the plastic. You have long chains, short chains. So you've probably seen, I think most things are switching to, is it the high density or the low density? High density polyethylene, so there's not very much branching on those chains, and so they can sit together really snugly. And then you can get stronger materials out of it. Low density polyethylene is what we're trying to phase out. You can take the high density stuff and you can recycle it. The low density stuff I don't think can be recycled. And it's common in plastic bags. So substituted, so if we take our polyethylenes and we add different types of molecules onto these, so start replacing hydrogens with things like chlorines, you get different properties. But you can still make really long chains. So polyvinyl chloride, we took an ethylene with a chlorine on it, it made a long chain out of those. And now each of those individual pieces also has a chloride on it. So PVC pipes, or plumbing, other plumbing fixtures made out of PVC. Um, but a lot of stuff, like this is probably made out of PVC. So instead of just using one type of monomer, we can use different types of monomers and put those together to get things like, or to get copolymers, adding copolymers so nylon is actually two different types of monomers that come together to form a dimer. And these are condensation polymers. So they eliminate an atom or a small group of atoms. So here we get water out to do that poly polymerization instead of a radical reaction. I'll look at that last slide. So a bunch of different polymers here. So the problem with plastics is that before we created them, as far as we know, they never existed. So all of these molecules, all of these things that are made out of carbon, primarily, there's nothing in nature that eats them or breaks them down. Although there are some like wax worms now that are able to eat some types of plastic. But this is why they get out into the environment and then mechanically they get ground down into really tiny pieces. And then those get washed into the ocean or they stay into the dirt. And that's where you get microplastics. So nothing knows how to break them down. So they just persist. All right.